Samuel. Say, that's not on the menu, preacher. Throw the menu out. That's what's killing churches now. They've organized God out the back door. 2 Samuel 21 and verse 1. 2 Samuel 21, 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, Now watch carefully. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn to them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. They answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them upon the Lord. We'll hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the, team, but the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ahia, whom she bare unto Saul, Armani and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. And it was told, David, what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. Father, bless your word now. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This is one of those stories in the Bible that has a um, powerful, powerful message to speak to our hearts. I want to go through a few things with you tonight. You know that Saul had gone... Probably insane. He was certainly demon possessed. And in verse number one, he had slain a bunch of the Gibeonites. <coughs> Who were the Gibeonites? These were the people of the land that had heard about how that the God of Israel had destroyed the walls of Jericho, and all the kings were fleeing before them. And so they conspired among themselves to try to deceive Israel, to accept them in their midst. And so they came to them with old moldy bread and rags and all of that and told this long story and Israel bought it. But instead of in, entreating, instead of asking, instead of calling upon God and seeking His face as it related to these people, they did a foolish thing. They just followed their emotions and believed what they said. It was like when Joshua stood outside of Ai and uh, stood outside of Ai and instead of inquiring of the Lord and finding out uh, what God's will was as it related to Ai, he just said, small place, we can take it. But they didn't take it. It tells us very clearly, folks, before you make any decisions, you need to be doing some praying. And they made a, deal. They made a covenant with the Gibeonites. And they found out that the Gibeonites had lied to them to see, but because of their word, they stuck to their word, which is an honorable thing. And God held them to that word. So the Gibeonites 
once discovered to the people that they had lied and had deceived them, they said, You will be hewers of wood and drawers of water from henceforth for the nation of Israel, but we will spare your life so you can live amongst us in the area and suburbs outside. And so the honor of Israel, their honor bound them to not harm these people because their word was all important. That reminds you how that God holds Israel accountable for their word, just like God holds himself accountable for his word. If they violated an oath, then they're God's people. God says, I won't stand for that because God does not violate oaths. When the Lord Jesus Christ was made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, God swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. And he made him a priest after an oath. And no priest on this earth had ever been made after an oath. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ was made a priest at his resurrection. For it tells you plain in the book of Hebrews that here on this earth that he had no priesthood. And so at his resurrection, he was made a priest. And of course, being a priest, he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father as a priest on the authority of an oath that God swore by himself. He doesn't break his word. That's how we can have a relationship with him. He doesn't break his word. That's what our relationship is built upon. It's not how you feel. And it's not even built upon the experiences you have. Your relationship with the Lord is built upon His Word. He'll not violate His Word. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Impossible for God to lie. That invisible one that cannot be seen nor known, but by revelation, that means He must first reveal Himself to you. You won't find Him. He reveals Himself to you. You know Him because of that. He cannot lie. Thanks be unto God for that tonight. Because that's the basis of our faith, is the fact that He cannot lie. Here in the book of 2 Samuel, then we have an issue that comes up with the Gibeonites. Saul kills a lot of them. There's nowhere in Scripture that records the event. So all we know is from what it says here. In other words, there's no reference back to the time and place that it happened. It just happened. If the Bible says it happened, it happened. That's good enough for me. And so he slew the Gibeonites because Saul was a bloody man. And so innocent blood was on his hands. And, of course, he was dead. So the blood passed, blood guiltiness passed upon his children. And when it passed upon his children, God held the land in judgment because innocent blood had been shed. This is why he came to Cain and said, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And the Bible says that if uh, the elders of the city, they go out and they find a dead body lying in the field. A dead body lying in the field. They do not know who killed that individual. But there's a certain ritual that they're supposed to go through to cleanse them of responsibility for the death of that individual. The blood that had been shed. Innocent blood in the sight of God's a big deal. He doesn't put up with it. He'll hold somebody accountable. They'll give an account. And God does not look lightly on murderers. He doesn't look lightly on murderers. And so the scripture says here that he brought a famine on the land. Verse 1. A famine is a product of judgment. Every time you find famine showing up in the Bible, it's a judgment of God. So the Gibeonites, as we know, had deceived them in Joshua chapter number 9. And now they're paying dearly for their deception. They're paying for it. And they paid dearly for it. But God did not ordain it. God simply used it to chasten his people and to bring them back where they should be. So the Bible says in uh, verse number 1 that Saul had slain them. I want you to notice what it says in verse 3. David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do? He knows there's a problem. And he wants to be honorable. He wants to do the honorable thing. What can I do? And then, of course, they said to him, we don't want, your money. We don't want his money. We want his, his silver nor gold. Verse 4, we don't want any of that. We don't want to just take it from any man in Israel. Our beef is not with Israel. Our beef is with the house of Saul. And so David says, all right, then what do you want? And they said, give us seven men, seven men, that we shall... Uh, we shall execute judgment and expiate this, uh, this blood guiltiness upon these seven men. In verse number 6, let seven men of his sons. I want you to notice in verse number 7, 
We're looking at two sons of Saul and five grandsons of Saul. That's what we're reading about here. Two sons and five grandsons makes a total of seven. But you notice that one spared, verse number seven, Mephibosheth. Not only was Mephibosheth brought up to the table to sit at the king's table when David said, What can I do for the house of Saul that I may show that I may show grace and mercy to the house of Saul because of his relationship with Jonathan? And he brought Lodi, he went to uh, Lodibar and he got Mephibosheth and brought him up and set him at the king's table. Mephibosheth ate the king's meat. That was the grace of God. Mephibosheth said, what am I, a dog like me, that you'd bring in to a king's table? But he didn't realize that there's a whole lot more that God has for you besides eating at his table. It's all right to eat at his table. That's a good thing because we're going to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But there's also a shield and a sword and a protection and an angel that goes with every single believer of the Lord God Almighty. He encampeth about them that fear him. There's a difference made once you belong to him. So God's no respecter of persons. In salvation, he isn't. The Bible said he should taste death for every man. But once you belong to him, it'll be just like it was in the Old Testament, in the, book, in, in the land of Egypt, when Goshen was separated from all the other judgments that God brought upon them. In Goshen, the light was shining when it was dark in Egypt. In Goshen, they were eating when the rest of the land was hungry. In Goshen, they were protected from the plagues while the plagues smote the rest of them. Why? Because they belonged to Him. And you belong to Him. And that's one of the reasons that I believe in the rapture of the church when he comes to take the body of Christ out of this world when the wrath of God is poured out. The wrath of God is poured out upon an unbelieving world, a godless, reprobate world that is well deserving of what's coming its way. That's exactly right. Sixty million babies have died at the hands of the butchers in America. Nobody says anything about it. Nobody cries. I'm talking about in the government and the people who, you know, the movers and the shakers, and those that are responsible. There are plenty of people crying out about it, no doubt about that. But the people that are accountable, the culpable ones, they don't say anything. And the blood flows. But these babies the Lord loves, they're human beings just like you. He tasted death for them just like you. And you can spend it any way you want to. And now, just in the last few days... I saw something, one of the most shocking things, and it's hard to be shocked anymore with what happens in America. But this woman said that, uh, made a statement about abortion, about a child, and made a statement as if to say that if a child is born into a family for a certain period of time, if the family doesn't want the child, why shouldn't we just let them do away with that child? Did you hear that? A few heard it. That's infanticide. That's infanticide. But you lay the groundwork when you kill the babies. You know, they call them a fetus. I never used the term. That's some Mickey Mouse medical terminology. It has nothing to do with the fact that John the Baptist in his mother's womb was jumping up and down and shouting about the birth of Christ. And Jeremiah, God said, I knew thee before you came to the world. I formed thee, ordained thee a prophet and all that. He didn't say anything about a fetus. He's talking about a person, an identity, a personality and all that. You know. Here's the thing to do. Resist them. Don't let them show, teach you how to think. You don't have to listen to their words. Don't let them pump your head full of their terminology, their philosophy, their, and, their, and their vision and their take on life. Let God's Word do it. Re, rebel against everything they try to say to you. When they, come, when they put a new spin on it, the spirit of this age, anything, the way they look at things and all of that, just look them and eyeball and eyeball and say, too bad you're stupid. This is the Word of God. <laughs> That's the kind of spirit you have to have. You have to resist them. You have to stick with the Lord. Because, folks, 50 years from now, most of them will be dead and gone. 50 years from now, most of them will be standing in the judgment. And 50 years from now, there'll be nothing but a faded memory of the time they were on this earth. And they'll be standing before that almighty, eternal being. And that's where we're going, and that's where they're going. And that is certain. And you better be ready. You better be ready. And I'll guarantee you one thing. When the time comes that these people, whether it be a president, a queen, or a prime minister... The time comes when they leave this world, they leave it just like you. And when they leave this world, they go before an almighty God just like you. 
And I'll, tell, I'll guarantee you one thing. God could not care less who they knew or who was a mover and a shaker. They answer to holiness. It doesn't mean a thing to the Almighty. And they will shake and they will quiver. Probably one of the most remarkable things you'll ever see in your life is when you watch queens and kings literally shaken to death as they're standing before Almighty God. When you see presidents with their teeth and their knees knocking. Have you read in the book of Daniel what happened to Belshazzar? When he saw a hand upon a wall, many, many tickled you farzen, weighed in the balances found water. What does the Bible say he did? His knees smote together. And that was just from seeing that on the wall. What do you think he did when he went out to saw and he saw God? What he will do is humiliate everything that's ever walked the face of this earth that's not born again. He will humiliate them. He will humble them, and they will fall down crumpled before him, and they will shake and quiver and quake from presidents to ditch diggers. It makes no difference in the sight of God. So, accept Jesus tonight, and you'll have one that you're in, safe in the Beloved, protected within the ark of the covenant and the ark of safety. So Mephibosheth was saved. He was kept because of his relationship with David through Jonathan. Amen. In verse number 9, they hanged them on a tree. Would a lot of people say that it's possibly a, a situation where uh, they, uh, they could have been crucified. I'm not sure of that. You can, you can add to the scripture. It's easy to do all of these things, but they hung them on a tree. And uh, when they hung them, that's an indication that they were cursed because the Bible says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. But now I want to call your attention to verse 10. This is the beautiful thing about this picture. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock. From the beginning of harvest, five long months, Rizpah stayed out there on that rock. Five months, she stayed on that rock, and she drove away the birds and the beast, so that the bodies of these men that had died, that had been killed, their life had been taken from them, so that their bodies would, be, would not be violated or mutilated by the animals and by, uh, by the elements. That's love. That's love. She went out there, and she was a concubine. Uh, it, there's something in the Bible about the one who's the underdog, the one who's, who's run over, the one who's kicked about, the one, the one who doesn't get a, a fair shake like Leah. The Bible says she had what kind of eyes? Tender. She was tender-eyed. That meant she had a tender heart. Leah wanted him to love her, and he never did. He never did. She wanted Jacob to love her, but Jacob never loved her. And she bore him all these children. Jacob had children by wives and concubines, or handmaids as they called them. In the Old Testament, there's some things in there that uh, you better look at them very carefully. And one of them is the multiple wives that they had. God told them in Deuteronomy not to multiply wives. He said in the book of Matthew chapter 19, he said, male and female created he them. One man, one woman. Not one pervert and another pervert, but a man and a woman. That's what he said. That's a marriage. Anything else is, is, is an adulteration. It's an abomination. It certainly is, folks. Resist it. Fight it. Go back and go against it. As much as they, what you're getting now out of the news media, you're getting a constant dose. Did you know that in, that in 2014, they're having the Winter Olympics in Russia? And did you know the ambassador from Russia today or yesterday or some high official in Russia has said that if the Sodomites come into Russia and they're holding hands and they're kissing, we're going to throw you in jail. And there's a big stink and an uproar. Oh, it's a horrible thing to think that they would, be, that they would treat them like that in Russia. Have you heard anybody in our country say anything like that lately? When was the last time you heard a senator or a governor or a mayor, or a president, or, a, or any other high and mighty official in this nation say anything like that. What? 
20 years ago, it was all about communism, 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 communism. All of the prophecy teachers, that's all you could hear. 30 years ago was communism is going to take over the world. That's the mark of the beast. That's the power of the Antichrist. Communism, 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 communism. They were all wrong. All the good ones were wrong. Communism is not going to take over anything. Islam looks like it's taking over a lot. It looks like it's taking over a lot. There's an awful lot of prophecy that's reactionary. Prophetic teachers are reactionary. They go out and they assess the situation, put their finger up, check which way the wind's blowing, and then create a little scenario to match it. I don't, that's why you don't, hear me, you don't hear me preaching on this stuff about, well, where is America in prophecy? Well, I'm America, somebody said America is not in prophecy. Well, they are. The Bible said the nations of the earth mourned and wept over Babylon. And if America doesn't get right with God, it'll be one of the mourning. <laughs> you mean that's all? Listen. The reason I don't do that is because I don't want to become a reactionary like them. It's easy to be a reactionary, to see what's going on, and then just formulate your little, your little system to match it. So what are you saying all that for? Well, Russia appears to me like it's turning toward God, and America appears to me like it is turning away from God. How does that figure? Nobody saw that 30 years ago. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody even came close. That's instructive. That's very instructive. So, Vladimir Putin has made it very clear that if you go over there in Russia and you, and you start uh, talking about, uh, you go hold hands in front of children, little children, or men with men kissing and women with women, the same thing. Say, Nothing. Nothing. You're going to jail. Yeah, you're going to jail. They're going to put you in a slammer. And the gay community, and I don't like that word gay, the sodomite community is up in arms over this. The rainbow flags are flying everywhere. And you have all, you have all this sympathetic reporting from the American news media. Isn't that sad? Folks, this is the country you live in. This is where you're living. All right? That's where you live. You're right smack in the middle of it. This is the people that you rub shoulders with. They just arrested eight. Did you see the news where they got eight up here at Douglas Dam? Eight men. Do you see that? I don't know how many of those faces on there had wives and children, and people recognized them, you know. Here their faces brought, is blasted right across the screen. You know, had eight men up here with men. That's, that's all I need to say about it. And it's going on everywhere. That's the kind of stuff that's going on in this country. But nobody will stand up and nobody will say anything that needs to be said to do something about it. Only the preachers, only the preachers and the preachers that will are the ones that are going to do it. So the bottom line is that the Old Testament where the marriages were many marriages, 700 wives and 300 concubines and all of that, that is in preparation for the grace of God for today, we are held to a much higher standard. Much higher. What's your standard now, preacher? Let a deacon be the husband of one wife. Let a bishop be the husband of one wife. One wife. Not two wives, not three wives, not four wives. One wife. One wife. And that's a standard because that standard represents Christ and His church. Christ only has one bride. God the Father has one wife. The wife of God is Israel, and the bride of Christ is the church of God. That's it. Only one. And today, we're paying a dear price. No, we're not. The children are. For what's happening in the courtrooms and in the, in the broken homes and all that's going. The children are paying a horrible price. But anyway, Rizpah was a concubine. No rights. She's just a sex slave, essentially. That's all she was. A sex slave. That's all she was. She had no right of inheritance or anything of that nature. So, you know, I mean, he's, these Hebrew kings, Saul, the rest of them, David had his concubines. And when his son Absalom uh, rebelled against him, you know, he did on top of the housetop in front of all Israel, some of David's concubines, right on the housetop. Right in, that's the worst contempt he could possibly have showed. For his daddy. He did it right there on the housetop in front of all of Israel. 
And um, so the situation is that uh, here's a woman that had nothing, had no respect or anything like that, yet she rose to one of the greatest heights in all the Bible. She showed pure love that you hardly ever see from anybody. God has a way of bringing those who don't have anything Amen. and He raises them up Amen. out of the dunghill. Amen. Amen. He delights in doing that. He does. Men build organizations, belong to it, make, make a big deal about it, wear, wear their pens where I belong to this organization, look at me, and it stinks in the nostrils of God. He loves that one that is the outcast, downcast, downtrodden, has no opportunities, nothing, yet they rise above the rest of them. Look at Saul's bloody murder compared to Rizpah's love. Look at the two. Compare the two. When David found out about it, the Bible says that he took the bones of Saul and Jonathan, gathered the bones of these, uh, these dead put them all together and gave them a, uh, in the burial at the, at the tomb of Kish because Saul was the son of Kish he was so moved by the love of Rizpah that it moved his heart and it stirred him if you have that kind of love it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a change in you Amen. and you don't have to talk about it it's like you know there's too much talk about love <laughs> when you preach about love what are you preaching about either you do or you don't are you following me? Amen. It's like the bumper sticker that says, I'm God. What a poor fool. When God shows up, you don't have to need a bumper sticker. If that almighty being came through that back door right there and walked down this aisle and began to manifest his glory and his power, everybody would start shaking and quaking in this house and we'd be down on our faces. You'd feel that power move across this thing like wind blowing in this auditorium. And it would literally bring you to your knees. You wouldn't have to see a thing. You'd know it's the presence of the Lord. No, he's... <laughs> it would it wouldn't be. No, it wouldn't be. Brother Blue called him Benny Chicken. <laughs> Brother Blue had a lot of things that he did. You know, he'd get away with it. He'd do this, you know. <laughs> Aren't many Baptist preachers? I've never seen one do that before. <laughs> uh, I respect Brother Blue. I got his picture hanging on my wall. Yeah. Um, it's, if it's real love, it's going to come out. See, that's the point. If it's real faith, it's going to be manifested. If you're real, people are going to know about it. And there's nothing that turns all of us off. All of us. All of us. Nothing turns us off any quicker than a phony. And there's nothing that makes you hate yourself any more than when you get phony. <laughs> so she was real. She fit in there with Uriah the Hittite. She fit in there with... Uh, uh, what was that one's name? They put the Ark of the Covenant in his house. Obed, Obed, Obed Edom, servant of Edom, Edomite. Uriah the Hittite, Obed the Edomite, Ruth the Moabite. Here we have, uh, uh, we have Rizpah the Hivite. When you go back and check her genealogy, you'll find out that she was not an Israelite. She was a Hivite. You go back and look at their, look at their, pedigree and you see them all begin to fit together there's a message there that God will show us if we we'll listen to him that's why we don't make a big deal about men in this house and about people we make a big deal about God and once God starts manifesting himself through you people get hungry for that it's like a magnet the real God, listen, the real God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will set your soul on fire. He'll draw you. The problem is that you're up to here with religion. You got it up to here with all the fakery and phony, the cliches and hackneyed expressions. But once God ever really touches you, He'll set a fire in you that'll never be put out the rest of your life, and you'll never be satisfied. Until it's the Lord touching you again. Never. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. 
I say, how do you get along, preacher, without running around with the, with the big crowd? Now, I get along just fine. <laughs> I get along real good. I really do. I get along real good. But I'd never make it if I didn't have the Lord. Here and there, He'll drop me a handful on purpose. Father, in Jesus' name, thank You for the story of Rizpah. Heavenly Father, for the great truth, Lord, we'll meet that lady one day. She was treated like a dog. She was a piece of merchandise. She was used and used up. But Heavenly Father, she had a soul. She had a heart. She had a heart. And God, she showed in that what we seldom ever see in anyone. Now, Lord, may help us tonight. Help us in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. All right, let's see here.